Hi, it's Kate Brownfield from ADHDKidsCanThrive.com. Thank you for being here. Thank you for listening. I appreciate you all. My guest today is Kara Johnson. She is a teacher, mom of four, parent of ADHD kids, and creator of We Have to Go Through It on Instagram, where she shares stories and strategies for your child's hardest moments. I invited Kira to join me today to share with other parents her top five pieces of wisdom for other parents who are raising kids with ADHD. Please enjoy our conversation. All right, Kira, thank you for being here. I'm looking forward to speaking with you today. Me too. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so why don't we just start from the very beginning and just tell us a little bit about yourself and your family and, and who you are. Sure. Okay, so it's me, Kira, and then I'm married. And I have four kids. My oldest is about to be 10 and then nine and six. And my baby just turned one. So we're kind of leaving babyhood too. My oldest two are adopted. They're full brothers. They're 11 months apart. So they're like best friends, mortal enemies. And my husband and I came into parenting really young. We were like 22 or 23 when the boys moved into our home as part of foster care. And eventually we got to adopt them. But obviously, it was such a messy learning curve for both of us who were not intending on starting a family at that point. And then here we are. So there just was a lot of learning really fast for us. I am a teacher by trade. I have taught English language learners. And first grade was the last classroom I was in. Love those little ones. And what was your specialty in teacher in teaching? Was it elementary? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, Okay. So I have a license in K-6 and an ELL for K-12 for English language learners. But I really liked being in the classroom with younger kids and took leave two years ago to stay home with my baby. So. Oh, good. Lucky children. Okay, good. Okay. And then now I discovered you on social media and Instagram, and you're doing a lot of advocacy for kids who struggle emotionally. Is that primarily for ADHD kiddos? I'd say that a lot of parents who follow me have diagnosed kids or have concerns about that or questions about whether that applies to them. But the reality is these moments of dysregulation and big feelings are universal through kids and adults. So it's the tools for how we handle those intentionally and the reality that best practices for special needs students or for our kids with learning disabilities ultimately benefit all kids. So what are those best tools that we can use no matter what diagnoses our kid may or may not have? Yeah. Okay. And so you're advocating now, working as a coach and an advocate to help other parents who are going through similar things? Yeah. My biggest thing is to help parents navigate those big moments in whatever way I can. So sometimes that's just chatting together on Instagram. I teach a live course specifically about meltdowns. I've taught a couple professional developments for schools or for moms groups. And really, I've just had this moment of going, wait, I've actually learned a lot. Our family has overcome a lot. And if I could marry my mom brain and my teacher brain and make this information accessible for other parents, we could all help each other a lot. When we were in like the height of our struggle with one of our kids in particular, I would feel so mad when I scrolled on social media and saw different advice or read different, you know, parenting books that I felt like, well, this is a lovely idea, but what am I supposed to do with this? Or what does this look like in real life? Or what's the one thing that I could do today? Like I'm overwhelmed. I don't have space for any more just sweet sounding ideas. I need real actual things that will help me today, even if it's just one little tip. Yeah, so that's kind of my goal. Do not take up anybody else's just bandwidth unless it's truly helpful. Okay. So I asked Kira to join us to give us her like top five pieces of wisdom that she would share with other parents that they should internalize or take from her to help them in their own lives. So let's start. We're going to do the top five countdown. And we'll, well start with number real, five. Last night, <laughs> last night, I'm sitting at the dinner table with my kids and I'm telling them about this. And I said, hey, this other mom is wanting to know what are some things that would help someone with ADHD, which we've talked with them about. I'm like, what are things that maybe your teachers have done or we do at home that would help you? And just the blankest stares. They all had, they were like, nothing. What? 
<laughs> let them pick dinner. So before you go off thinking I'm some kind of guru, <laughs> I have five things I think will really help you. But in actuality, your kids may not have the language for that. My number five starts with building your team. So you need to loop in classroom teachers and grandparents, or if you have like a regular babysitter, or before you go to an extended family event, like, hey, let's all learn about ADHD. And you don't have to ask them to read some big book. But hey, I just found out my six-year-old, we went to the doctor and they said that he probably has ADHD. For him, it's hard to, you know, get things done on time, to stay organized. Sometimes he kind of flies off the handle about things that seem like a small deal. Here's a couple of ways that I help him at home. Or if while I'm out today, he does something like this, it probably will be best if you respond like that. And just front loading some information to people because people want to help and be on your team, but they just might not know. Sometimes we think people are being judgy. It just might be that they don't know how to engage in a helpful way. And so what if you started this school year with an email to your teacher, your kid's teacher that said, hey, thank you so much for having Johnny in class this year. He's so excited to meet you. I wanted to let you know that we'll back you up. Let us know whatever you need. And here's a little bit about Johnny, what works for him and what's a challenge for him. Please let me know if there's any way I can support. And just start the conversation so that your first contact isn't something negative. Yeah, that's great advice. I think that helps to like disarm the teacher. So they don't feel like they are dealing with a parent that is in denial right? of yes. their child. And you're just teaching people how to talk with you about your kid. Yeah, because that's great. There might be some struggle for your kid with other adults or with other peers, and that's just reality. But it doesn't have to be a topic of offense between you and another adult. If you lay the groundwork for, I'm aware of this and here's how we're working on it, a lot of people are typically willing to problem solve with you. Okay, great advice. Okay, what about number four? Number four is not very shiny sounding, but I live by it. Okay. I think it's important to operate within visuals and using routines as much as you can. And I'm especially looking at parents of young children, preschoolers, early childhood, but I would imagine this stays helpful into adulthood. There are a lot of things that you do every single day that are routine that you maybe haven't even noticed. The way you wake up and get breakfast and brush your teeth and put your shoes on, that for you with a neurotypical brain might just be a deep habit that you already have. You're not even thinking about it. But your child is thinking about so many things and so many ideas. Those routines just don't solidify the same way. But what if you just posted that routine instead of berating them for forgetting or being distracted? Just say, hey, check your list. What's next? Or where are you at on your on your morning routine? And keep it neutral by using a list to be the enforcer. Okay. So you use a list like for the morning routine. And where do you yeah. keep that list? Ours is either on our fridge, which is kind of by our front door or on the door itself. Okay. I've even like made it on my smartphone and casted it up on our TV. Like oh, that's uh, wherever great. you are with a sticky note, wherever you are, just a three click checklist of like shoes, coat, car. And then you're not following them around going, what are you doing? I said, put your shoe on. This is the 10th time. I'm not going to tell you again. It's just a way to keep your relationship more neutral and put that responsibility on them, but in a way that feels manageable. Yeah. Okay. So you say, look at the list. Did you do yeah, the checklist? What's your job? Where are you at? And kind of asking those prompting questions that trigger that executive functioning we want to help grow. I'm not telling you what your job is. You're capable of going and finding out because I've made the information available. Yeah. Okay. And you do lists versus pictures? This is This is one thing I started to say is, Depending on your reading skills, my kids really struggled with reading. And so we use a lot of visuals. Let's not add another task. Let's use pictures. Let's not put another barrier in the way of understanding your job. If I can show you a picture of shoes and then a van, we can just do that. We don't yeah. have to make it complicated. Okay. okay but so right. there's the level of using checklists for things like that. But then also to whatever extent you can, filling your days with a general routine. And this changes as your kid ages. But like one example in our house is that 
for years. Like I said, my oldest is 10. And this is still true when he's not at school. We eat lunch and then it's quiet time. And like, that's just a routine. And for you, that maybe just sounds like, well, that's just parenting. But the point is, what can you make predictable in your home? If you can make more of your life predictable, you free up some of your kids' bandwidth for unpredictable things, for flexible things that change because they know some of that predictable routine is always there. Yeah. Okay, good. And do you have a predictable routine, I imagine, like for nighttime too? Right. It's not even some big like, well, we take a bath and then it's five minutes of books and then it's we eat dinner and we clean up and we watch a show and we go to bed. And yeah, there's little things that happen in there, but we always know, oh, that's when the TV turns on. That's when bedtime is. So you lose kind of some power struggles by just doing it the same way every day. Okay. What's number three? Number three, (laughs) I said, get okay with saying yes. Your ADHD kids have so many ideas. They have such a huge amount of creativity and innovation. And lots of times their ideas are way too big and impractical for what you could ever pull off. But it's one of the really cool things about them, their ability to generate fun. Yeah, And so we kind of have to loosen our grip on the word no. Like, does it really matter if you pull your mattress down the stairs to make a slide? I want to say no, because that feels disruptive and messy and I have to clean it up. But if we're home all day, does it matter if you do that? If we're on a walk, does it matter if you lay down in the puddle? Sometimes it matters, but today, does it matter? Can I say yes? And if you can just get okay with saying yes as much as possible, your nose can mean a lot more and your relationship feels so much more fun. That's great advice. And that is not easy to do. No, because it does involve mess and flexibility. But the counter is when you say no a bunch of times, you're creating a bunch of relational mess by your kid feeling pent up and controlled and annoyed at you. Yeah. So you're going to choose. Are you going to wash some laundry or are you going to bicker at your kids all day? Yeah. And that's your parenting choice, right? What kind of family life do you want to create? And there certainly are times you say no, but if you can give a yes, that's a gift to your kid and to yourself. Okay, Kira, what is advice piece number two? I said, and this may not be true for all ADHD kids, but for mine in particular, to give them a physical outlet before they find one. I believe ADHD comes out of your body in one way or another. Sometimes it's my kid yammering and making all kinds of noises at 6 a.m. in the morning. And sometimes it's their bodies slamming into each other and ricocheting off the walls. And that's fine until it's disrupting everybody else, right? Right. So I want to create an outlet for all of that energy before that energy is spent making sister mad or breaking something or being dangerous. So a couple examples, we go outside a lot. We have some space in our basement that doesn't have a lot of furniture or anything in it where you can be rough, where you can run, where you can be loud. We encourage a lot of wrestling and taught rules for wrestling so that you can be really physical but not just hurting each other all the time. Yeah, that's great. That's a benefit of being brothers. (laughs) Yeah, You can really practice on someone. (laughs) But if I know my kid is going to be this way, it would be silly of me to be surprised by their high energy every single day. It would be smart of me to plan for high energy moments in advance of them just going crazy. That's great. Okay. So you've, you've accommodated your home to kind of serve that. And you do live in the Midwest where there is weather. So the basement helps, right? When it's like really bad weather. Yeah. And I have found again, not true for all kids, especially if you have a pretty sensory sensitive kid or avoidant kid, but kids with this amount of energy and creativity are not as bothered by weather as adults are they find that really cold snow refreshing and the rain and the mud gives them new ideas. If you can part with some clothes and make some stuff okay to get wrecked, they're going to have fun out there even if the weather is bad. Yeah, great. So you put them in a snowsuit and go outside. Uh 
two-year-olds, three-year-olds, four-year-olds, and you're thinking, Kira, it's so much work to bundle them up and then I have to go out with them. I just am a testament that it really does pay off. They eventually dress themselves. They eventually stay outside in the snow longer than it took them to get dressed. Like it comes, just keep doing it. It's hard right now, but it's going to pay off. Yeah. Okay, good. Okay. So what's number one? What's your number one piece of advice for parents? This is my number one. And I think it's most practical and most just good idea. And Kate, I know totally aligns with this. You have to be comfortable parenting the child you have. You're not raising anybody else's child. You're not raising your child if he didn't have ADHD. You're not raising your child 10 years from now when you hope that there is somebody else. Your kid already is somebody. And there's somebody great. There's amazing strengths inside of them and real challenges. But that is your reality. If you spend so much time comparing yourself to parents who don't have kids like yours, or to advice aimed at other kinds of children, resentment and bitterness grows both for you and for your child. Parent the kid that's in your house. That kid is wonderful and you're the best parent out there for them. Embrace that and don't get too worried about he's behind or he's delayed or by now his teacher says he should have. Yours is the only kid that you need to compare himself to.